One day I decided, hey, how high can this jet go? I, I never knew, right? In, in the test pilot school, it said 50,000 plus. And I'm like, well, I wonder what the plus sign means, right? If you are the leader, great, because you have the ability to set the tone. If you're not, that's okay too. You still can make change. Are you focused on the mission? Are you aligned? Back to that word you used, are you aligned? Today's guest is a former U.S. Navy fighter pilot who is also the lead solo pilot of the Blue Angels. Cooler than that. During the interview, I found out that he actually flew in the original Top Gun film. He now applies everything that he's learned as an expert in how to build and how to get the most out of high performance teams so that way you can trust people, you can trust the system, and you can actually get things done. So please help me in welcoming to the We Do Hard Things podcast, the man who flew a plane as high into the atmosphere as possible just to see how high it could go, John Foley. How did it feel when you earned that golden helmet? And it's only, I only ask that not because I'm a pilot, not that I really know anything about being a pilot, but it seems like a pretty big achievement based off of, you know, all the speaking that you do and everything else. Yeah, Mark. Well, first off, thanks for having me here. It's uh, it's an honor to be with you and and your audience. Uh, that was a big moment, you know. As I think back to it, uh, it I I as a twelve year old boy was um, taking an air show by my dad. I looked up there and I saw those jets that day, uh, and I remember turning to my dad saying, "Dad, I want to do that." And so it took me eighteen years until I had an opportunity to put that gold helmet on, and uh, it was. It was transformational, but I will tell you, the moment I, I walked into the Blue Angels, I realized I needed up my game. So it wasn't like a celebration. It was just the opposite. I was like, holy crap, I need now to really take my game to a whole new level. And and I mean, that's, um, I mean, it's a very exclusive group. I mean, you, I know that you've talked about the fact that there is turnover every year and you're always growing and you're, you know, people are coming and going and what have you, but but uh, you had to work for that. It was an achievement. And then you find yourself now <laughs> like worried that maybe you just don't have it. You're not good enough or you just got to up the game to keep up with, with all of those peers who are better than you. Yeah. I wouldn't say I was fearful. This is a good point. Cause I know we, we want to talk about fear, right? Uh, I was what I call scared. And that's to me different than being afraid. Cause I mm -hmm. think fear causes stuckness, right? Mm -hmm. But scared was like, holy cow, the little hairs are standing up on the back of my neck, right? Um, I'm starting to say, I've got to take my game to a whole new level. Now, here's the, here's the good part, is I knew that I wasn't just me. There was a team. We had a process. We had a way to do that. So I was confident that it could be done. It just meant that I needed to really buckle down, increase my beliefs, and put every ounce of effort into it. Well, I, I wanted to start there because it seemed, it seemed like a, a really big moment. But the, 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 the feeling you felt of being scared, stepping up to that next level, when you reflect upon it, was it really any different than the feeling of, uh, I don't know, taking the controls for the first time or, or having, having, again, I'm not a pilot. My cousin's been a pilot and all of this stuff. So yeah. I'm just imagining that, you know, when they say, okay, you're now in control of the plane. Okay. You're now the one who's going to set it down for the first time. Um, okay, you're now the one who's going to do all of those steps in between you learning how to fly and being amazing. At it. <laughs> like, is it is it always the same thing? No, you know, it's a great question, because it's a little bit different. There's a subtlety here. And that is, you know, uh, before you become a Blue Angel, the first thing I do is become a Navy pilot, right? Yeah. And that's challenging in itself. Uh, I remember it, and there's no guarantees, you know, uh, first off, you work so hard just to get that shot. And there's, you know, medical qualifications, the academic, all that kind of stuff. And uh, you start off with small airplanes first, T-34. Then you go to immediate jets. And then that's a T-2, then the A-4 back in my day. Um, and every time you realize that you are, you're increasing the speed and the capabilities and the performance of the airplane, and you, you're, you're on this ladder and, and growing. So there was a little difference. And that is, the first time, you know, you fly an airplane, it's like, okay, it's a big machine and, and there are certain procedures I need to do and the, I need to know emergency procedures and, and you learn all that stuff, uh, but it takes, it takes practice, right? And the more you do it, 
the more you become one with the jet. Now, when you get to the Blue Angels, you're already at an extremely high level. Mm -hmm. I had flown jets off aircraft carriers, been an instructor pilot. Um, so I knew how to fly the airplane. I knew how to fight the airplane. What I didn't know was how to, to do the, what we call the maximum performance of the human being and the jet. Mm -hmm. That's what I needed to be taught. I, I used to be involved uh, in auto racing and okay. I, I guess there's this principle of, of driving a car, what, what this French man explained to me as 10, 10, meaning you are 100% up until the point where you have to be on full on the brakes and okay. then you lift and then you're full on the throttle again. Yep. And this idea of if you could really know the machine and the course and, and if everything is correct, your aim is to try and be all out into the moment where you're not all out and then back to all out again as quickly as possible. Right. Now, I don't know if that's true or not because I've heard other people talk about rolling through corners and all this stuff, but. I, I think you, you're right. I'll tell you why. Because a good friend of mine, J Jackie Heinrichter, she's the first woman owner of, of a racing team at that high level. And she's got a simulator in her in her home. And I'm not talking about just a simple simulator, but that's exactly how I was taught. We were doing hot laps at the Long Beach Grand Prix. And that's exactly it. I mean, they have markers. One, two, three, you're going in full on, full brakes. I blew me away when, when you feel that, right? And then you, you know, coming out is, uh, is, is just full on again. So you're right. And that's actually what's interesting about the, the F-18 and flying with the blues. You are the same thing. You're either in a full stick deflection roll or you're back to neutral. There's nothing in between in the solo program. In the, in the formation, you're making all kinds of little maneuvers, but it's very similar to, to race car driving. Well, and, and so I guess what I'm trying to dig into, because for us on the outside, we just see this like, amazing, you're doing it. We don't think of the intuitive or the, the, the muscle memory or the training or the things that went into making you what I would say is superhuman, like just doing some of the coolest, baddest stuff ever. So, so if you are, how do you go from scared to 10, 10 or whatever it is you'd call it? Yeah. I love the 10, 10. I, I just got off a, a podcast with uh, Dr. Bill Dorfman. I don't know if you had a chance to meet with him and, and he, he had a saying, I am a 10 and he, he teaches this to kids. Right. And I think that's really important to realize how you talk to yourself. So it gets back to the, the concept that you're talking about is see, I'm okay with being scared to me. Scared's awareness. Scared is the little hairs, you know, scared's like, wow, this is a big opportunity. How am I going to tackle it? Uh, but it's different than fear because fear, what I find it's, you know, it causes stuckness. Heck, you can see it in the world, right? You can see it in yourselves. And um, and I think that's different. So uh, I'm always scared. I actually like being scared. If I'm not, it means eh, maybe I'm, I'm a little complacent, right? So uh, it's like living on that edge. And I think what's interesting is what I've learned, whether it's flying an airplane to the absolute limits, uh, you've got to know when to back off, right? Mm. You, 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 it's called pushing the envelope. So I can be on the very edge of the highest performance, but I can't stay there. One of two things are going to happen. Either I'm going to bust it. And in, 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 in aviation, you saw the right stuff, right? Remember that movie? Yes. Did you ever see that? Yes. Yeah. The only scene I really, really remember. I mean, I remember a few when, when they keep breaking the sound barrier and then yes. the one of the long hallway with the guy running down because he has a really important message. <laughs> Exactly. Well, when they're breaking the sound barrier, you know, one of Chuck Yeager's thing is he had to eject from an airplane because he busted the envelope, right? And um, and then the airplane got in a spin and he had to, he had to eject out. So you know that's what will happen, right? It, it doesn't. Um, it, it's a violent when you bust the envelope or you lose control, right? And so you you want to know where that edge is. And the what I found is what you do is you push it and you back off. You push it and you back off. You push it and you back off. I call it nibbling the envelope because you know you can't stay there. So I want to be in control. I don't want to be um, responding. I want to be reacting. But you, or actually, just the opposite. I want to. You, I want to respond, not react. I want to be in control. But you don't know if you've crossed the envelope until you're out of control. Right? Well, like, you can feel it. 
you, you can feel it. You're, you're, you're right on the edge. I mean, stuff gets very sensitive. I, I took the jet up. One day I decided, hey, how high can this jet go? I, I never knew, right? And uh, uh, and so it said in, in the test pilot school, it said 50,000 plus. And I'm like, well, I wonder what the plus sign means, right? Hold and on, they, so, let you, they let you do stuff like that if you want to? Well, it's not just if you want to. I was on a test hop, right? And, okay. uh, and, and so the idea was, um, I got it up there. You have to do a parabola. So I'm on the very envelope. By the way, you can start to see the curvature of the earth. It's kind of cool. Um, and I've just got my finger on the stick, just like this, you know, because you're not ham fisting the jet at that point. It's subtle. I mean, the wings, the, the engines are dumping fuel in there. It's full afterburners, but there's not enough oxygen for them to ignite that much. So they're, they're starting to, to snuff out and the, the airflow, you know, is, is not as stable up there. And, and so you've got to be very, very subtle with your movements. And once I got the nose to come over, then I knew I was okay because now the nose is going to come straight down. I'll start to build uh, airspeed again, but um, you can feel it when you're on the edge, you can feel it. And for you, is the edge like at that point, is that a stall or is that like yeah, you're worried point. that the metal is going to rip off of the, <laughs> the wings or something? It could be either. You're right. So you just took the two extremes, right? <laughs> oh, okay, uh, great. <laughs> yeah. So most I, I only of, know movies. So <laughs> most of it, you know, uh, actually the, the mistakes is stalls, you know, people stall while they're landing and they lose the lift and then they crash. And so you, you learn as a pilot to how to, how to come through a stall. Right. And, uh, and when you're dog fighting, you have to be really aware of, of is the airplane going to go quote ballistic. Remember the movie Top Gun? You know, the, I haven't the, seen it. I'm going to be honest with you. I know there's a new one coming out. I haven't seen yeah, it. <laughs> the new one's going to be great. I flew in the original movie and Did you? you know, the, Oh yeah. Yeah. And I was just in the right place at the right time. We were flying off the carrier deck of the enterprise. This is back in 1986, that's when we we filmed the first Top Gun movie. That is awesome. The new one's going to have great footage. I can't wait for people to see it. It's 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 phenomenal camera work. Um, but in that movie, there's a, there's one of the sayings where "Let's go ballistic." I think is mm -hmm. Goose says to Maverick or something like that. Um, so there's a difference, right? But but the idea of of uh, of a stall is you have to be aware when you're dog fighting. Uh, but you also can go you know, too fast or pull too many G's. That's usually the, the problem. Um, and you could rip the wings off the airplane. There's uh, pictures of F4s where they just pull too hard and the wing comes right off the jet. So it could be either one. It could be either one. So, uh, you know, I, I, I typically think, you know, how is this conversation going to go before, before recording, right? I want to have an arc. I want to know how I want to tie yeah. things together. And I never thought that we'd be having this conversation. Right now. So this is really cool. But but once you do these cool things, how do you go home? How do you, how do you retire? Like, how do you retire from this? Like without feeling like the coolest things were behind you? You know, I think it's different for every person. For me, uh, I just needed to reinvent myself. And I think that's real important for everybody uh, not to live in the past. Right. So that was just one portion of my life. It was, an important portion, right? Um, as a kid, I wanted to do it. Um, took 18 years. Uh, I was actually in the Navy uh, 22 years. Uh, you know, you had to work your way up to those levels. Um, as far as with the Blue Angels, after you finish flying with the Blues, you go back to the fleet. You go back to the real Navy. You go back to flying jets off aircraft carriers. That's kind of fun. I mean, that gets your blood going, right? So you still got that adrenaline, and, and but you go back in more of an instructor role, more of a leadership role. And I think that you start to pivot. And it's no longer about personal mastery. It's more about team mastery, which you're always on a team when you're younger too, but it's more about leadership, right? It's more about how can you serve others? Mm -hmm. And uh, and then, you know, then the big switch comes, well, at some point, you know, you're, you're done with your Navy career and uh, you have to reinvent yourself. And, and that's what I've done numerous times. Uh, and I find that, you know, now I'm more passionate doing this, you know, sharing this information with others, uh, creating a company that, that, you know, people can learn from and, and you. So if I can take these experiences and transfer them to mm -hmm. somebody else, that's what excites me. That's what so, gets me going. So, so do, you, do you still fly or? You know, very little. No, I, I really don't. And so I don't you, need you that were able desire. to like put that, put that back and then onto the next thing. 
Well, for me now, you know, others, you know, they, they just love flying. So they'll buy airplanes, they'll fly for the airlines. You know, there's yeah. lots of that, you know, there's flying in your blood. For me, it was more of, okay, uh, did that, really enjoyed every minute of it. Um, what else can I do in life? And I remember my dad showed me you could have multiple careers. Uh, he was a, uh, an army colonel. Uh, and then he also was chairman of, of Metropolitan Water District in LA. Uh, and he showed me that you can, you can actually transfer some of the skills that worked in the military to the normal life. Some transfer, some don't, by the way, which is really interesting mm -hmm. to know the difference. But the idea was, um, boy, I want to do that. And uh, I actually went to Stanford Business School, fortunate there, and, and that my whole life opened up because uh, there was this word called entrepreneur. I couldn't even spell it, right? And I still, I sat I still there. have to Google it because I mess up those last, those damn yeah. French people, right? What kind of word is entrepreneur? <laughs> and that's, that's what hooked me. Of course, it was Silicon Valley in the late 90s. You know, we talk about the hotbed of what was happening. And that was an exciting world. And I got to play in that world for a little bit and then started my own company. And, uh, you know, now you and I are out there. We're inspiring people and more than inspiring them, it's giving them a path. To, to excellence. I love it. I love it. Well, that, that was all just me just being yeah. really, really curious about those things. What, what I wanted to really focus on with you is the idea of trust. Okay. So um, I have come to learn that I'm not really the most trusting person in the world. Um, you know, I, it, it, uh, it causes me anxiety because I'm, if, if I know that if I respect you, and I believe you, and I know you're worried, I don't have to worry. But if I don't know you, if, if I'm not sure who you are, if I, if I don't think you're worrying about the things that I'm worrying about, then I get very, very worried. And so therefore, mm -hmm. I like, I, I believe, and this is crazy, maybe because maybe I'm an entrepreneur, like I believe if I have an electrician come to my house, that I'm going to care more about my house and the job than the electrician would. So therefore, mm -hmm. whether I'm good at it or not, I'll just do a better job than they would, because I care more. It's mine. They're just doing a job. And I know that you talk about trust so much in terms of leadership, in terms of team, in terms of the fact that you guys were all flying wing to wing and doing all of this stuff. Yeah. Is there a way for us to, to be, is there a way for us to be able to come to terms with this and come to trust people more? And yeah. what does that unlock for us? Yeah. So for me, there's what I call the four C's of trust. And I, I came up with these in reflection back to not just my time in the Navy, but on sports teams and business and in life, right? So here's what I call the four C's. The first is competency. So, you know, are you competent? Is the person you're dealing with, this electrician, you know, are they competent in, in what they do? And, and that's usually pretty easy to determine. I mean, there's lots of ways in this world where um, sometimes they give you a degree, which doesn't mean you're competent at all, but it means <laughs> you did something, right? Um, uh, it always cracks me up that, you know, uh, how about one day that um, while someone's in med school and they're, they're training to be a doctor, uh, they can't operate on you by yourself, but all of a sudden the next day they, they get designated a doctor and they can, right? So it, it's, it, it's interesting, right? But my point is the idea of competency is, is, is the first starting point. And are you surrounded by people who are highly competent? And they need to prove that every day. See, that's not a one-time thing, right? Um, I know I have to prove that every day in my jet, you know, am I competent? Okay, well, so that's easy. Let's not spend too much time there. Um, the next one is commitment. Way more important to me in trust. All right. You know, uh, are, are you committed? Is the team committed? Is everybody committed? And that can mean different things to different people, right? Some people are just trying to get the job done and move on to something else. Others, when you're on the Blue Angels, you're 100% in. I mean, the commitment is, I'll do anything. You can count on me. It's not somebody else's job. I own it, right? We'll, we'll come out with the outcome. So commitment is huge. Uh, the third C is character. And, um, you know, this is something that it's, it's so fundamental, but it's so important in our, our souls. You know, uh, what's my integrity? What's my character? Uh, if you have a bus there, man, it's just, it's time not to deal with those people. Move on, right? Because character has to be who you are and, you know, yeah. what you do when people aren't looking. Go ahead. But that's an alignment of character. Like, I mean, I can have a ah. character and a set of values and beliefs and so can you, and Beautiful. it's not yours are right or wrong. It's just, it's just, we're not aligned. Right. 
That's beautiful. That's right. That's a, I call this a center point exercise for alignment, but you're exactly right. Is what are those core values? Do we agree to those core values? Mm-hmm. And, uh, and, you know, you can see right now, you know, in the world, there's a lot of different alignment. There's no, there's not alignment on core values. Right. Um, so much. the idea of what that is, is important. I agree with you hundred percent. And that's why the culture of an organization is real important so that you're not guessing what are those core values. Um, so I, I agree with you. Yeah. Character, you know, is, is absolutely critical. Uh, and then the last one is consistency. And this is the one that makes or breaks it, hmm. right? Are you consistently, do you bring your A game? You know, when I'm flying 18 inches from another jet, let me tell you, consistency matters. You know, I, I got to know that, 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 you're on your A game. And if you're not, you're going to clear the formation or if there's a problem, right? So I think that's the one that I've noticed mostly in, I would say the business world is that's where the lack is, you know, of consistency of always at the top of your game. Oh, interesting. And and do you believe that just the machine that is because I've always been curious as to the type of person who's attracted to a, a military career or they find themselves in one. I mean, I'm, you know, I've only been able to ponder that, you know, people find themselves there because they're attracted to it or they believe in honor or for financial reasons or for schooling reasons. There's, there's a reason they become there. And then the military machine puts out people in certain ways. And I found that, that those who are leaders coming out of it, like yourselves, like, like other people I've spoken to, um, they just, I can tell, like they have a framework, they have a way of thinking, they have a way of speaking. It just is there. And so does the military do something to produce better consistent people and outcomes than this other, you know, world that we live in? You know, it's a great observation. I, I asked that of my dad once uh, in a little different way. I said, hey, dad, what was similar and what was different about being highly successful in the military? He commanded brigades and was in you know Thailand, and he was a he was an engineer by the way, uh, built roads and stuff, um, and the civilian world. And here's what he said, and it gets right back to what you're saying. He says, "I can show up into any organization within the army. He happened to be in the army. Uh, it could be the infantry, artillery. You know, it doesn't matter. Um, the Marines, the Navy, the Air Force." Uh, I could just show up and everyone's going to fall within a band. And he kind of went like this with his hands. Okay. He said, they may be left or right of that, but I'm going to know where they're going to fall. He said, but in the world that I'm in right now, you know, it's out here. And what he really did is he went, it's out here, right? You just don't know. Um, And so I, I think that your observation is, is interestingly, accurate is yes, there's a culture that you are um, brought into uh, in the military. They're actually slightly different. The Air Force has a different one than the Navy, than the Marines and the Army. Um, But there is a culture and uh, you have to fall within that culture. You can be left or right a little bit, but there's a there's a culture there. And I think that's also attracts people that want to be part of something larger than than themselves. That's what Mm -hmm. I say. And, uh, and that's what's critical is you need to be part of something larger than yourself. Do you think that, that you said that you have to fit in within the culture or else you bounce, but does it take people who do not fit in and turn them into people who do? Are there lessons we can be, that we can learn in terms of consistency and other things like that? Yeah, I think it's both, right? Because people are people. I don't want you to think that, um, you know, everybody's comes out of the military or is in the military, you know, thinks exactly the same way. No, because there is value in diversity of thinking, right? Um, I think the way I'd like to say it is that in my experience, let's take the extremes. You, you hadn't saw the movie Top Gun, but there's Maverick and Iceman. Okay. And I'll just tell it for your audience as most people have seen the movie know, you know, Maverick was kind of this rogue character. He was pushing the limits and Iceman was this methodical, you know, discipline, um, just ice. Right. And those were the characters that Hollywood portrayed and Hollywood being Hollywood usually takes something and, and just makes it extreme. Right. The answer is it's usually somewhere in the middle. Okay. Usually somewhere, you know, those characteristics, of focus and discipline, you need those, but you also need this characteristic of adaptability, this characteristic of uh, things change. 
I mean, when I, when I get airborne, you know, I brief a flight, the minute I get airborne, I know that things are going to change mm. and I'm okay with that. I love change. I love adapting to change. So um, I think that, you know, it, it, while people can be unique and everybody has their own personalities for sure. Um, the idea is, are you focused on the mission? Are you aligned back to that word you used? Are you aligned with a, a mission? And I would suggest a mission that's higher than yourself. I love that. I love that. Um, and so looking at the four C's for trust, which is, which isn't something, I mean, I've, I've not really come across that before, even to break down. And I know there's a formula for everything, but even to break down yeah. trust, I love that so much. Now, when there isn't an alignment of character, yeah, good point. when there isn't uh, the commitment, I have found that, that I, I, I'm very uncomfortable <laughs> just being so black and white of it. Like, like, listen, it's not you. It's not me. It's just, this isn't working or, or, you know, being able to, being able to read within myself. Oh, I'm feeling off about this person because I'm sensing a lack of commitment in them or even reflecting upon myself. Oh, I'm not stepping up and providing the commitment that others need so they can trust me. Uh, how do we go about fixing these things? Yeah. Well, good point. I, I think the first thing that you brought up is the awareness, right? And, and the awareness in yourself. And uh, usually it's, it's pretty obvious to the other person. So the, the, the first thing that, that we did on the Blue Angels and, and that I like to teach is what I call a glad to be here debrief. And what that is, is that it's an environment where we can have these discussions. I call it a safe environment. And we did them all the time. We didn't do it just when there was a problem. In this case, problem with trust, right? Um, we were reinforcing what went well all the time. And we were also identifying, oh, guess what? There's some gaps here and we're working on that. And so I think you need to have an environment that's a safe environment, not just physical safety, which we all need with COVID and all that. I'm talking psychological safety, right? Where you can say, I'm upset. This isn't working. You know, mm -hmm. things that you're, you're talking about. So to me, that's the tool that allows you to deal with these situations. Now, at some point, um, if people are not going to buy in to the to the program, then yeah, there's there's time to it's time to move on, right? And uh, and and who you surround yourself with matters. So I found the other thing is small things matter. You know, right. there's this beautiful quote, um, and it says, "Put your faith in the small things, because that's where your strength comes from." You have any idea what business leader or sports star said that or coach? Uh, I, I couldn't even guess. Right. It's it's actually Mother Teresa. Oh, <laughs> you I know. Set I was me just, up, man. I you did set, set me up. You up. <laughs> uh, but it, it, I think she's right, and I think that's really critical in trust. Small things matter. And so, if uh, you know a listener or even even myself, you know, if we find ourselves we're working in an environment, we're entrepreneurs, we're, we're, we're starting up or we're trying to scale our team or even at home. I think if I were to start obviously by being more aware of it and then sit down and think, you know, I'm going to provide more grace to people. I'm going to create a safer environment. I think they would look at me like, what are you doing, Mark? <laughs> so, so, so I can understand it being really successful when it's in place, the safe environment, these talks, these debriefs, um, you know, working through everything. How do you go from not doing this to, to doing it? Yeah, I'll go back to another quote uh, of Gandhi, right? He says, be the change you want to see in the yes. world, right? So as you were asking that question, I'm with you. It's hard, especially if that's not the culture, especially if that's not the situation you're in. Um, I think change starts on the inside and then works its way out. So it starts with you. Right. So um, if you are the leader or if it's you know your company or this situation, um, great, because you have the ability to set the tone. If you're not, that's OK, too. You still can make change. You know, if it's the, the classic, if you want someone to be trustworthy, be trustworthy yourself first. Mm. So whenever I think about that, it's so easy to point the finger right at someone mm. else. And I learned this in my life. And I still have to teach this to myself all the time. There's three of them pointing back at me, right? Right, right, right. 
so like what's the first step if we can get really tactical here it's just it's just deciding that okay i'm going to hold myself to these four c's and then watch what others do like how would how would you get started if you weren't living this all the time already yeah so the first step is i would start to implement a debrief procedure in whatever organizational change i'm going through or in the relationship you know and say let's um you know, let's talk. It's not, it's not to have a talk about the lack of trust. Let's talk about the event that just happened. Let's talk about, you know, um, the situation that it's at hand and you do it pre and post, right? So I think of it this way. I think of the brief is the preparation, mm-hmm. you know, are, are the standards clear? Do we know what the standards are? Do we know the roles and responsibilities? Are we clear on that? You have the actual event itself, and then what most people forget is there's a there's another debrief that needs to occur, right? On what just happened. So I'll give me an example. Like at the end of this podcast, when I do my podcast, I stay on with the guest and I say, "Hey, let's do a quick debrief. You know, tell me what what went really well for you." And I'm happy to do this with you, by the way. Um, <laughs> I and, love it. And what else could I do? You know, is there something that that could have gone better? But I always look inward first. And then you start to discuss the outer situation. What, I, what I'm just realizing now is it, it seems to me that um, how much would you attribute your success through your career and what you're able to do? And even, even these, these frameworks that you've put together to just a really strong ability for you to be able to effectively communicate what you think, what you feel, what you believe, what you know. Uh, I, I, imagine, I imagine that has to be a skill set that you have. Yeah, I think um, it's kind of beautiful uh, that you mentioned that, but the words behind not only communicate, the beliefs, I think, is where I would go to, right? So you mentioned that word. And um, communication is definitely a skill. We can we can learn it, um, you know, both individually and as an organization, right? Um, absolutely critical. Clarity is, is important on that. But I go to the beliefs. I say, you know, first start with what's in your heart, Right. What do you believe? To me, that's where the clarity needs to start. I, I, I like to teach a framework where it's the old vision, plan, execute, feedback loop. You know, we've all heard that. What's the vision? Come up with a plan, execute on plan. What's my feedback loop? I like to take it to a whole new level. So you asked that earlier. You know, this is about going to a whole new level, right? Yeah. And so I don't talk about vision so much. What I like to talk about is beliefs. What do we believe? How do we get commitment and buy into that vision? What's limiting me? What's liberating me? What's limiting us? What's liberating us? So for me, it's not about vision. It's about commitment and buy-in. It's about beliefs. Hmm. So you start there and then you build a plan, get prepared, get alignment on it, execute on that plan. And I like to execute through what I call high trust contracts. So we're talking about trust. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, And then you got to have this debrief process that allows you to uh, that's really the continuous improvement loop. But having said all of that, we've talked a lot about the I'd say the framework and the tactics and the tools. The real answer is what's on my shirt and what's behind me here. To me, the essence, the secret sauce is living a glad to be here life that changes the world, which is which is based on positivity. It's based on gratitude. It's it's based on. Uh, uh, lack of ego, I, I've heard you speak about. Yeah, it's it's an ethos. It's the way you see the world, and it's the way the world sees you. But let me let me just flip it on you real quick. What does "glad to be here" mean to you right now? Um, well, for me, I spend so much of my time doing things out of obligation. Yeah. Or uh, you know, I'm 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 a husband. Uh, I'm a father of four kids. Uh, I've been running a business for 15 years. Uh, I spend a lot of my time doing things for other people. And yeah. so the idea when we started and I said, glad to be here, like, like I, I'm, I genuinely love these types of conversations. Yeah. And, yeah. and so I often challenge myself to think like, uh, like, like it feels like cheating if I could just do this all the time, right? Like, <laughs> sure, like surely no one can build a life where they do things that they love all the time. Um, but I, I'm glad to be here. I'm so glad you're here. I have so much um, gratitude for the ability to spend this time with you and have this type of conversation and even release it. It's just, it feels like a total joy. That's what it means to me. 
That's it. You, that's the essence. And and what you just described, I could feel your passion. If you looked at yourself, wait till you see this, your yeah. eyes light up, you start leaning in. Um, you know, that's what I want everybody to feel. You know, that's what we all need to feel. That's the essence of being grateful in the present moment. That I think is the first starting point. Okay. And so I've been working the last few weeks actually to try and figure out. So, so, so for, for me, a little bit of backstory, you know, I've been running a, a marketing agency and a communications firm for 15 years, 14 years, something like that. And uh, five years ago, we started to pivot. We started to make changes uh, and Corona virus, certainly pandemic certainly didn't help, but luckily the, the, the benefit is because we started pivoting a few years ago, our business wasn't wiped away. We still had other revenue streams yeah. that we could rely on. And so we pivoted away from old business to a new business. But because of all of this change, uh, either there's two ways to look at this. Either I've lost a lot of stuff that I've had or I've been unburdened <laughs> from right. some of the stuff I used to have to do. And now I have this opportunity to say like, what do I really want my days, my life, my team, my, our communications, our structure, all of that. What do we want this to build into? And I right. still bump up against, as I described to you, this idea of like, if I could do this all the time, like, uh, like who, who, you know, who could possibly build their life in such a way where they're spending 90% of the time doing the things that makes them glad to be there. Um, so, so for me, is it possible? Is it is an unrealistic expectation um, to really do so? Uh, is it selfish? Is it any of those things that I worry about? Well, I think um, number one, my belief is you can have it all. You can have a great life. Okay, you can have exactly what you just described, where you're doing what you love and what you're doing benefits others. And I think that actually you kind of got to flip them because if you're doing something that benefits others, you'll start to find the gratitude and, and the, the purpose in your own life. So to me, um, absolutely, you can have it all. You can do that. Now, there are challenges. Let's be real, right? There's challenges out there. Um, there's things we need to pivot on. By the way, congratulations on pivoting. That's awesome. You know, we have to do the same thing. I mean, I was doing 100 live events a year, yeah. you know? And uh, that went to zero. Yeah. Uh, uh, and then after about three months, you know, we figured out this Zoom. Uh, and now we're doing, you know, I did 60 events in the last two months, right? So the, the idea of, of, uh, of learning from the challenges and pivoting, and just like you, when the live events come back, that's great. We have a whole new business um, division within the company, right? And so it's really cool to, to see that. Um, and, and I believe that what glad to be here means is not only being grateful for the present moment, but also let's look back to the past and think about the mentors, the people who have helped you, even yesterday. Like uh, I do this gratitude practice where every morning I wake up and I say, what am I grateful for in the present moment? Uh, I go back to yesterday, say, what happened yesterday? Did I have something to be grateful for? And I was on uh, another podcast. Uh, uh, by the way, I think uh, you know him, Scoggins, right? Yes, Stephen. Yeah, Stephen, we were just yeah. on yesterday, right? Great, yeah, unbelievable great guy. guy, right? And, he is and just, he, so like, I had him on the podcast uh, a, f a few weeks ago. I think I asked him four questions and the hour zip five. Man, that guy. Yes. Oh. Yeah. I love it. So, so I think about that, right? I remember that. And then I go forward in my day and I say, you know, uh, who am I going to be impacting today? And if I know it, you came to my mind. You were one of the first things that came to my mind. And I said, man, I, I can't wait to be with Mark. I can't wait to be with his people and, and his audience and just talk and, and share things, right? So that's my gratitude practice. I do it every morning. What am I grateful for in the present moment, the past, and the future? And that actually rewires your brain and allows you to see opportunities instead of threats. Hmm. Like how, 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 how much of your time can you live in that space? You know, that's a good question. It depends, I think, on um, on the amount of seeds that you've planted. See, I believe that uh, what we're experiencing right now in this present moment uh, is because of some seeds we planted in the past, right? Mm -hmm. And what's interesting about seeds is 
uh, it's kind of what's beautiful is you you they're similar. So if you do something kind and generous for somebody, you will get something kind and generous back. Uh, if you do the opposite, that's going to turn up in your life too. So the idea here, the, the challenge is this thing called time, right? It's really hard to put a cause and effect directly together and say, this is what caused that, right? right. Um, because of the time element. But so my belief is just keep doing good things. Just keep planting good seeds. Just keep helping others. Uh, you know, being on your podcast today. I mean, I'm trying to, you know, we're growing our podcast. And the best way I can do that is help you grow yours. That I know. I know that for sure. And I'm already learning from you right now, which is just <laughs> awesome, right? But do, you, but do you, are you able, are you built to, or are you able to stay in that place up here? Yeah. Let's say um, 90% of the time without slipping into, fear, scared, yeah. Uh, yeah. doubt, um, you know, uh, feeling off about something you did, something you said, or whatever it is, or like, are you built this way? Or have you constructed a way to spend enough time there? Yeah, I think it's the second one is the most important part, because I think we're all built the same. Okay. Mm. Um, but how we our experiences, whether as a child, as a family, you know, I had a great family. I mean, my mom and dad, my mom was this picture of love. My dad was a picture of wisdom. Uh, they made me feel supported. Um, and, you know, not everybody has that, right? I get that. In fact, it's rare, right? Mostly um, it's probably the opposite, right? So how that we come up, uh, brought up affects us. But here's the beautiful part. I believe we have choice. We can choose a lot of things. Some things are forced on us. Okay. So it's not like I can instance, instant, I can't just say, Hey, I want to feel happy. No, uh, you know, I, I can't do that. Sometimes just yesterday was a tough day for me. So the answer to your question is, yeah, man, I have struggles all the time. Um, but what I try to do is in those struggles go, okay, this is actually a gift. You know, this is a gift. Uh, I believe people are angels out there, meaning they're there to, to help me grow. If I need to grow and I need to learn, um, Okay. I don't like it. <laughs> I'll be honest with you, man. I don't like the conflict either. I'm really conflict avoidant. Um, but I, I try to say, okay, I need to grow on this. And I really think that, and I don't know, you know, Hebb's law, right? Neurons that wire together, fire together, this idea that we can train, train our brains. And so the more you do what I call this appreciation and glad to be here mindset, the more that that will come in your life. Now, having said all of that, I totally get that there's some people that are in very deep states, right? It's not about just saying, oh, I'm going to think more grateful and, and it's going to get me out. No, we got to change our body. We got to change our physiology. We got to change, you know, a lot of things. We need support from others, like the support that you give people, right? And you, you talked to them about that. There, there's all different, different ways and levels that we need to go through. But yeah, I am generally like this all the time. I mean, I don't know what you're feeling, uh, but this is not I, fake. I, I, I expect it. Yeah. You're, you're more, um, there's more energy and more uh, positivity and more like, I don't know how to explain it. It's just like, I, I feel like I'm talking to an old friend, whereas I expected nah, you this. to be one tough, hard nah. jerk. <laughs> and I didn't get that from your videos. It's just when everything was booked right. and I was like, okay you know, military guy, achiever, did all of these things. Okay. Like, yeah, I, I didn't expect someone so warm, I guess I should say. Oh, uh, thank you. I feel the same with you. Um, uh, and I really do. I, I looked at, I researched you too. And I said, oh man, he's going to be a tough guy. You know, he's, he's, he's like this. <laughs> um, but you know, I, look at us, you know, we're both bald. If people were to walk down the street, they might go, oh, these guys are, are tough. But you know, we're all, I think deep in our heart, we're, people are more similar than we are dissimilar, mm -hmm. right? And I think that's a, a real lesson for the country right now, um, no matter what, right? We're all more similar than we are dissimilar. Um, let's take care of each other. Let's mm -hmm. be kind. Um, uh, yes, of course, you got to execute and you, you've got to do the things that we talked about earlier. Um, but I think that, you know, it's really about connecting the heart and the head. And let's start with the heart. So, so if, if I may, you know, it's the We Do Hard Things podcast. Yep. Uh, obviously, uh, 
most of us don't want to do hard things. Uh, some yeah. of us step up and actually do them. And the reason I called it that is because I realized that I just need to redefine who I am. Mark Drager does hard things. And nice. uh, a, a few weeks ago, we were having my son's birthday and they're um, on this rope course, like high up in the air and in harnesses. And my six-year-old is standing 30 feet off the ground or something. And she's just shaking. I said, if, I said, are you okay? You know, like, um, are you okay? Keep going. And then she looks down, she goes, Dragers do hard things. And I'm like, <laughs> yes, yes. It's so good. Like, I, I'm so proud of you in this moment. It's amazing. You can redefine what you think about yourself by telling yourself a new story. Oh, but, but all of that said, you know, we learned so much by facing the hard things, overcoming the hard things as you yeah. you're pushing the envelope, you know, uh, yeah. whatever wording you use, experimenting with the envelope. So when you think back, if, you, if, if you're comfortable, can you share a few hard yeah. things that you had to push through, you had to learn from, or, or maybe you didn't even win in that, that really helped form where you are now in your life? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the, the first one hits me because I've been through many challenges, right? Uh, the very first one was when I got rejected for the uh, Naval Academy uh, because they said I was not physically qualified. And this was my dream, right? 12-year-old kid, see the blue jets fly, um, went through all the steps, did the best I could in school and sports. And, you know, it looked like eh, this is going to work. I mean, I I'm probably going to be able to get in. Uh, and all of a sudden, I got rejected medically. And I, I was in physical good shape, played football, wrestling. And here's what they said. They said, you have too much protein in your urine. So first off, what is that? And uh, and what am I supposed to do about Eat it? Less right? chicken. You know? <laughs> yeah, it's like, yeah, exactly. Well, you know what it turns out is interesting. I was on an Atkins diet back then for mm -hmm. wrestling. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, but we didn't know that. So the whole point was, um, you know, what do you do? Here's your dream just blown up, at least I thought, right? And um, I was disappointed. I was disappointed at first. And then I said, you know, I got to come up with plan B. And plan B was let's reapply. So I reapplied and guess what? They rejected me again, right? And I'm like, hmm, okay, now I got, I got to get to plan C. Well, plan C was let's go to Colorado for a year. Um, let's play football, walk on. I wasn't recruited. And, uh, and let's ski. Let's make life fun, right? <laughs> okay. um, and then reapply. And I did. And I had to go through all the medical waiver process and took me about a year. And eventually I did get selected. And then, you know, I was able to pick up on that original dream, right? So the idea was, I think, um, what I learned from that initial rejection is that, you know, no is not final, right? Uh, it just means that's not the path I'm going to use today. I'm going to find another path and I'm going to, I'm going to get to that, that spot. Now that was a little easier than I'll, I'll be more open and honest here is, um, about 2000, I had uh, left the military. Um, I'd been working in venture capital. I was starting a company called Centerpoint Entertainment, which was uh, going to be the NASCAR of aviation. We we're rolling up the air show industry, performers. Um, and uh, I had two of the three things. I had the air shows and I had the performers. What I didn't have was TV and marketing, right? You're mm -hmm. a marketing guy, you know. So I'm down in uh, uh, New York at ESPN and I'm going to close my deal, an equity deal with ESPN on a day that became very um, poignant for a lot of people. It's 9-11. Hmm. Uh, and I was there. I mean, I, I saw the jets hit the tower. Uh, I saw the towers come down. I, uh, um, I actually, my reaction reaction was to run towards the towers, not away, and which I did, you know, to try to help. And there wasn't much help you could do at that point, right? Um, but that whole deal blew up that day. I mean, I, my business was gone, you know, um, and I had $347,000 in debt, all my own money, um, gone. Right. Uh, then the next thing that happened two weeks later, the, uh, my sweetheart who I thought I was going to marry dumps me. <laughs> so now I'm like, Whoa, you know, now I lost my business. I just lost the relationship. And that actually hurt more. You know, I, I could yeah. figure out the business stuff. Right. Um, and you know, now what are you going to do? So it took me a year, you know, to, to overcome that adversity. Uh, and it really was a blessing, uh, because I, uh, I met someone else and, you know, we're married now. So that's beautiful. Um, we ended up, uh, starting a, a different company. I actually went to an event on personal growth, things like you and I are doing right here. 
And all of a sudden a light bulb came on and I went, wow, I can really contribute here. I can share this with others uh, to, to help them. Uh, and now, you know, I'm loving what I'm doing. Mm -hmm. So I'm so glad those other things uh, didn't happen. That's, but let me tell you at the time, the way, but... yeah, it sucks, doesn't it? At the time, and you look back and you go, thank you. And that's one of my big prayers is just thank you. Just thank you for everything. I love that. That's so beautiful. I mean, so for, for both of them, it seems that patience or time or taking a really long view mm. was required because, you know, I used to, I, I, I've, I've said this to my wife and other, and my kids and whatnot, but it's always like, listen, it, it, it's not over until it works out. And if it hasn't worked out, it's not over yet. It's a great and so great I state. try to live that, but you know, I, I can just imagine, um, you know, you're, you're, how old did you say you were when you applied the first time? 21? To, the, to college? Yeah, it was, no, it was probably like 18. Yeah. 18. 17. Rejected. Try again. Rejected. Go away skiing. And then eventually you said you got it. So, so I'm, I'm adding up in my head as you're telling the story. I'm like, three years, maybe four years? Like how long did you have to wait? And for someone as a teenager, early 20s, that's like a huge portion of your life. You feel like you're behind. You feel like everyone's ahead. You feel like you've worked so hard for this. Like, losing your business and then a year later, you know, starting to rebuild. That's an incredible amount of time. Like yeah. how important is patience for this, this ability to be able to then later look back and go like, Oh, I'm so glad that that happened. I mean, yeah. you're not feeling that in the moment. We're all facing these moments right now. Every day yeah. we have these moments. I think um, one of the perfections and uh, I've got a, uh, a new program coming out on the seven perfections. One of the perfections is patience. You just nailed it. And they said, you know, patience is a virtue. I mean, that's there, but I think patience is much more than that. I also like to use the word endurance, right? Um, and that's where your power comes from. And I like to say power with grace. So what I've learned over life is that um, patience allows you to overcome anger, uh, you know, I, I love a quote that said, um, we should embrace challenges because with challenge comes endurance and with endurance comes character and with strong character, you're ready for anything. So, you know, in hindsight, as I look back, that's why it's really about endurance and having the longer view. Uh, so my last word I'll give you on that is faith. I just have a lot of faith things are going to work out. Now that was an unexpected interview. Going in, I thought John, you know, tough Navy guy, he's going to be all hardcore yet. He was so heartwarming. He was so encouraging. He actually stayed on the call for like another half an hour afterwards and we just chatted. But okay, three key takeaways for me. Number one, belief is so much more important than vision. Start with the buy-in before the plan. Number two, no is not final. It's just not the path that you're gonna to take today. You will find another path and you will get there eventually. And number three, the secret sauce is living a glad to be your life. Embrace gratitude and take on life with enthusiasm. If you do those things, it'll be a little bit easier to remember that those of us who have something to prove can show the world and ourselves that we have what it takes to make it happen. But you have to think big. You've got to be bold and you must say yes to life. If you need more next level conversations like I do, you've got to hear from Mr. Anthony Trucks. He blew my mind. Click on the link. I'll see you there. If you think about this, a gap between who you are and what you have and the person who has what you want. I got the gap for things I want to do, it's, but I just realized what the gap means, right? And so the